Oh, hey there, welcome to Hoffman Town Online. If this is your first time joining us, I want to welcome you to this video today. Be sure to check out the link in the description. You'll find more information about Hoffman Town. You'll find a place to donate money and a place to request prayer there as well. We're about to start in a few seconds, so be sure to say hi in the chat and get ready for worship. Again, welcome to Hoffman Town Online. Good morning, church family. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Would you stand to your feet with us? We want to welcome all of you who are joining us online, as well as those of you in the room. And a special welcome to all our guests here today. We're glad to have you joining us. Let's raise our voices this morning in worship to the risen King. We're going to sing some a medley of hymns. We're going to start with Christ the Lord is risen today. Sing it with us. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. 
it. You may be seated just for a moment. It's so good to see you today. Lots of familiar faces and some new faces. And we just say, welcome, welcome, welcome. If I haven't met you yet, I'm Pastor Lamar, and we're just so glad that you're here today. A pivotal day in the history of the universe. Amen? As we celebrate our risen Savior. And I'm telling you what, no place I'd rather be than these worship leaders leading me and you in worship. So we're grateful for that, aren't we? And there's more to come. You know what I like to say, the biggest choir in the church is right there. All right, right there. Okay, good. Well, we're glad you're here. If you, if you do happen to be a guest or visiting with us, we have something new. You want to look at the chair in front of you or within every third chair. So you'll see a little note there and it'll say, connect with us. We'd love for you to do that. If you're a technology person, you can QR code that. How about that? I turned QR code into a verb right there, didn't I? There's also a few, some cards in the chair backs. If you'd like to connect with us, they, they look something like this. We thought we'd get your attention. Hey, all right, there it is. But just want to know a little bit more about you, your, your family, if you have family, uh, so we can connect with you. Love to give you a gift, too, as well, for being here today. So I'm grateful. I want you to know we have been praying. I've been praying for each person who would come today and each person who <clears throat> might come through online. And I just want you to know, I, I may not know your name, or I do know all your names, but I didn't pray for you all by name, but we prayed for each person that would be here, that God would speak to us. Wouldn't that be great? We just want to say welcome. Let me get out of the way, and we'll get going with some more Easter worship, which is maybe rivals Christmas worship. I know some of you love Christmas music, but let's remember the words we're singing this morning. Can we do that? Amen. David, continue to lead us. Amen. All right. Would you go ahead and stand to your feet with us once again? We've been learning this song over the last few weeks. So let's declare with one voice this morning that Jesus Christ is not dead. He is alive. He is here. He lives. Amen. the tomb where he lay, see the stone rolled away, he is risen, he is risen, he's alive, yes, see his hands, see his feet, touch his scars, and believe, he is risen, he is risen, he's alive, oh, song of the redeemed. He is moving, he is moving, he's alive. Yes, he is. So take this freedom, take this love, can you feel it rising up? He is here, he is here, he's alive. Let's sing this next part right to the Savior. Let's sing it to Him.
Only by the blood it is finished. Yes, it is. Oh, it is finished. Come on, sing it again. Oh, you took all our shame, left it in the grave. We're forgiven. Oh, now we're forgiven. Hallelujah. The work forever done. Only by the blood. sin and death forever? Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, you can try to be seated. Go ahead. You can try. <laughs> You're going to want to stand here in a minute again. Go ahead. Be seated. <laughs> I say try because I don't know if you can tell we're just a little excited around here. We're a little happy, right? Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, he said, I am the resurrection. Let that sink in. I am the resurrection and the life the one who believes in me he said though he may die yet will he live and the one who lives by believing in me watch this will never die that's good news right there that's something to get excited about right that's why we're excited today and then he asks a very important question he says do you believe this? And all over the room this morning, dearly beloved, that's my question for you. That's the question I want you to ask yourself today. Do I truly believe that Jesus is who he says he was, that he came, that he died on the cross for my sins and your sins, that he rose again on the third day and that he is the resurrection and the life? Do you really believe that this morning? We've been singing about how he lives and about his glorious resurrection. Well, now we're going to shift a little bit. We're going to sing about the impact that has on our lives as believers, as Christians, and the future hope that we have. So Stacy's going to come and lead us, and you sing along with us. But listen, if you're struggling with that this morning, if you don't know, if you really believe, let me just encourage you this morning that God loves you. I believe that you're here by divine appointment. And as you listen to the words of these songs and pastor's sermon this morning, maybe, just maybe, today could be the day of salvation for you. Today is your invitation to believe, to believe. Listen to these words as we sing.
let's continue to what's been sung and raised up to our Heavenly Father. Let us raise up in prayer. As a church family, let's lift up these words to him. Father God, because your son lives, we can face tomorrow. Father God, thank you because your son lives. We have that future hope rooted and grounded in your son, Father God. Father God, we are so grateful to you that we can come together as a church family, Father God. The family that you put together 2,000 years ago. And Lord, we praise you. We praise you, Father, that we can be together and raise up your name high above every other name, Father God. Father, we thank you that you are the resurrection and the life. Lord, we thank you because you died on that cross. You gave us forgiveness, Father God. Lord, what a precious gift, not holding anything against us. Father, you laid that upon your son, though, so that we can live. Thank you that you sent your son to die as a substitute on that cross for us, Lord. Lord, what kind of love is that? A love that's overwhelming. Father God, we thank you that we can come into your throne room of grace and just bathe in your love and your mercy and your grace, Father God. Father God, as a word is proclaimed today, Lord, let us transform our heart, not just our mind. Lord, let us put into action, Lord, that it is finished. I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak mightily through Pastor Lamar, Lord. And Lord, I pray if there is someone there who is not someone here today or someone online have not turned their heart to you, I pray that this day may be that day that they will walk out of darkness into light, Lord. Father, as we proclaim this next hymn, the hymn of heaven, Father God, Lord, the words, Father God, we long to breathe the air of heaven. Lord, we thank you for that future hope. Lord, we are thankful that one day that the streets will be filled with grace and mercy no longer pain, Lord. Thank you that there'll be a day that there'll be no more death, Lord. Thank you, Lord, you defeated that on the cross eternally, Lord. So, Lord, we worship you, we praise you, we rejoice with you. Thank you, Father God. In your heavenly name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
the songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear. In the end, we'll see that it was worth it when He returns to wipe away our tears. Thank you, Jesus. There will be a day. to the screens, please.
as our video showed us, we've come full circle all the way back from Mount Moriah all the way to Mount Calvary. If you're wondering about that word, it's derived from the Latin. Uh, also in scripture, we know it as Golgotha, which is Aramaic. It's just outside of old Jerusalem. Also called in, in scripture in some versions, the place of the skull. And uh, many believe it to be a high peak. Guess where? Mount Moriah. Isn't that interesting how it comes around? So today we're looking at that phrase, it is finished. We're going to be in John chapter 19. You're going to want to turn there to John chapter 19. And i got a question for you as we begin. Can I ask you a question this morning? Just, just, we're just, well, you're sipping coffee. I don't drink coffee. We're, we're sipping something here and we're just having a little conversation, okay? And I want to ask you a question. Why is it so hard to finish things? Notice no one stood up and shouted out a good answer. Why is it so hard to finish things? It has been said, uh, what is important is not what you start, but what you finish. Maybe you've heard of that before. In fact, I would say there's kind of something gloomy about plans not completed. Have you ever known that? I've seen buildings and they're just, they never got completed. Or maybe dreams unrealized, projects unfinished. Promises not kept. So I'm going to take you all the way to the mountains, not of Israel, but of South Dakota. Anybody ever heard of Mount Rushmore? Anybody ever been to Mount Rushmore? Okay, we're going to have a test. Looking at it, you're looking at Mount Rushmore from left to right. I'll help you out. It starts with Washington, and then next is Jefferson, and then the guy kind of in the back... You can't just say Roosevelt, you have to say Teddy Roosevelt, and then finally there is Lincoln, Mount Rushmore, right? You've at least seen a picture of that, have you not? Over, in fact, over 200 million people come and visit Mount Rushmore each year, yet many of them do not know this. It is an unfinished work. Some of you smarties knew that. I saw you going like this, all right? Or else you're just doing that so that people would think you were smart. I don't know. It's unfinished. Did you know that? It was the intent of the sculpture, the sculptor, excuse me, and part of his original design for the presidents to be depicted, but not just this kind of bust, but all the way down to the waist. In fact, you can go and see the, the, the little sculpture of what it was supposed to look like, head to waist. But lack of funding and obviously the death of the original artist led to the project, as amazing as Mount Rushmore is, to remain unfinished. Well, today, as we gather this Easter, we look at those words, it is finished. It is so important for something to be finished. In fact, let me tell you something about God this morning as we begin. Before God shaped us from the dirt of the earth, before he breathed life into us and made us into his image, he knew something. He knew that we would reject and disobey him. Did you know that? He knew that we, not him, we would introduce sin and death into his perfect creation. And something had to be done. And we're going to talk about that this morning. Let's look at John 19, verses 28 through 30. John 19, verses 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, there's a lot of things that had happened leading up to it. Jesus is already on the cross. Many things are going on. You can read about it. Maybe you've heard of the seven last words of Christ. You can see the interactions that are going on on the cross. But we get to 28. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of of sour wine was sitting there so they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on hyssop and held it up to his mouth when Jesus had received the sour wine he said and it's red letter in my Bible here it is are you ready here's what Jesus said it is finished and you have an exclamation point there in English to show us that it's imperative it's emphatic, excuse me. It's emphatic. It is finished. It is absolutely finished. Then bowing his head, 
he gave up his spirit. Let's pray. God, I pray today you'd open our hearts, our minds, our ears. God, I ask you to remove distractions right now from this room, from, from homes or wherever people are watching online. Just remove distractions. Help us to focus in on what Jesus' words mean. Change us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we get in verse 28, and we see something interesting. It says, after this, when Jesus knew that everything was accomplished. Did you see that in Scripture? So Jesus knows that it's accomplished, and he's ready to speak. But remember, Jesus is fully God, but also when he was on the earth, he was what? Fully human, right? He's what I would say parched beyond belief. Can we use that? You ever been there? Can you imagine? I can't imagine this. If you go and study the agony of what was involved in the crucifixion and the scourging and the beatings and all those things that happened to Jesus, the crown of thorns, all these things that were going on leading up to the crucifixion. And Jesus needs to speak. And he's parched. So we get to verse 29. The soldiers, there's sour wine. The soldiers take a sponge, they soak it in sour wine on a hyssop branch, and they give what I would say, they give moisture to Jesus so he can speak. Isn't that interesting? Now, sour wine, we need to mention something about that. This, some of you might be thinking this. This is not what Jesus refused on the way to the cross. He was offered something as well on the way to the cross. Remember how heavy it was? And they had to draft Simon of Serene to to help carry Jesus' cross because he had been beaten so bad already up Golgotha Hill, okay? Mount Calvary. So it wasn't that. That was, Scripture clearly says, you can look it up, it says that was wine mixed with myrrh. I don't know what that would taste like, but it doesn't sound very good to me. But anyway, that was offered to him and he rejected it. But what this was, when you see sour wine there in your Bible, just know this. It's simply the drink soldiers, laborers, used to quench their, stir, their thirst as they were working. So it was common and normal to do that. But what's interesting to me is they stuck the sponge on a branch of hyssop. Does hyssop ring a bell to anybody? You think about that for a minute. Do you remember hyssop? A humble shrub used to paint the doorways of God's people in Egypt. Remember that? The first Passover. Painted with the blood of the sacrificial lamb. Do you remember that? They used hyssop to do the doorways. So the Passover angel would pass over them and death would not come to their house. So this sets us up for verse 30. And then we discover that after this had happened, after these things had occurred, Jesus speaks. Before he dies, he speaks. And this is what he says. Tetelestai. Have you ever heard of that word? That's not an English word. Tetelestai. It's one word in Greek, yet it speaks volumes. It's, it's uh, interpreted into English in this way. It is finished. But in Greek, one word that he said, tetelestai. Now, let's talk about the Greeks just for a moment, okay? They were proud people. Are you aware of that? I thought I'd get some amens. I got a lot of Greek blood in me, and I needed an amen, and you gave me nothing. You know, Windex will fix anything. Some of you know that movie? Hey, some of you do know Big Fat Greek Way. No, for the Greeks, they, they were very proud of a lot of things, but they were proud of this. I would, preachers would never survive in the Greek culture. They were very proud of succinct, concise language. All right? In fact, they had a saying. To give a sea of matter, that's S-E-A, to give a sea of matter in a drop of language. This is what perfect oratory was to them. And look what Jesus does. Jesus' one word wraps up the entire gospel that we call it, the good news in it. It gives, in this one word, it gives the basis of a believer's assurance. It gives the sum of all joy that can be had. And it gives the spirit of what we sing about at Christmas, the spirit of all divine consolation. One word, tetelestai. Now this word is from the verb telio, which means this. If you want to know and you want to jot it down, here it is. It means to bring to an end. Well, that makes sense. Finished, right? To bring to an end to complete, 
to accomplish. What it signifies is this. It signifies the successful end to a specific course of action. Now, you're like me. You've had a lot of courses of actions, right? You've done a lot of things. Were they always successful? Not for me, right? Not for me, right? Buy high, sell low. Anybody in that club? Yeah, okay. So it's a successful end to a specific course of action. Let me illustrate it in this way. It would be like uh, you, you go to climb the world's tallest mountain. We've got a mountain theme going here today. So tetelestai, it is finished, would be like reaching the peak of Mount Everest. Or for something a little more practical, we'd be making that final payment on the car. Or that final payment on the house, right? A successful completion to a course of action. Or for some of you, it would be like, I don't know how, God forbid, it's from the pit of hell, but this long distance running. Like, it would be like crossing the finish line of a 10K or a half marathon or a marathon. I would love to just go and sit there and watch someone come across and go, Tadalestai, but they don't do that. But it's a successful completion. It's finished. It's so much more than I survived. Are you hearing me? Maybe that's why they don't say it. It's more than I survived. It means I did exactly what I set out to do. Well, let's figure out how it was used in Jesus' time. When he cried out emphatically, Tetelestai, they, everybody there knew exactly what he was saying. You see, this word was used by slaves, by servants. When they completed an assigned task, slaves would then report to their master, and you know what they would say? Tetelestai. The job is finished that you assigned me. You assigned me this, it's finished. So let me just throw that in there with what Jesus is saying. Jesus came to accomplish an assignment. He came to accomplish his Father's will, and he did that. Let me illustrate that for you. John 17, 4. What a great part of Scripture. Jesus, at this point, he's praying to God the Father, and this is what he says, John 17, 4. I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. That's it. He did it. So the word was used by, in, in that way, is also used by the Greek priests, the uh, almost secular, if you will, the non-biblical, but the Greek priests, when worshipers would come to those temple and make sacrifices, the purpose of dedicating something to their gods and goddesses, their animal, they'd bring an animal and it'd be examined by the priest for blemishes, imper imperfections. If the sacrifice was found in these Greek temples to be faultless, to be acceptable, the priest would stand before them and say, Tetelestai. In this case, meaning it's perfect, it's good, it's been accomplished. Now let's think about lambs for a minute. Scripture makes it clear that Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, amen? Jesus, the Lamb of God, was without blemish and perfect. Of course, we're talking about sin here, and thus able to die for us. Let me read to you 1 Peter 1.19. 1 Peter 1.19 talks about, here it is, the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. So it was used in that way. Tetelestai was also used by a person who was an artist. Uh, when a sculpture or painting was completed, the artist would say, it is finished. They would say, tetelestai. Jesus fulfilled all of the Old Testament types and pictures that pointed to his coming. He, he fulfilled them all. Whatever type or picture or prophecy or saying about the coming Messiah, it is finished. Jesus did that. And one other thing. One other area I would share with you is this. This word was used by businessmen. Many of you may have heard of that before. When one would pay a debt completely, isn't that a good thing? They'd get a receipt, and the receipt would say, give these percentages of tips. No, that's what we, we get today. No. The receipt would say this, tetelestai. The debt is what? Paid in full. Jesus paid our sin debt on the cross. Do you believe it? 
Listen to John 1, 29. The next day, John, I'm talking about John the baptizer, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Paid him full. Romans 6, 23, you know it. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is what? Eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paid in full by Jesus. One more thing I want you to notice about this word, it is finished, this tetelestai is this. In the biblical language, it's important to look at the tense, and this is in the perfect tense. Well, what does that mean? Why are you talking about that? This is not English class. No, it's not. But it speaks of an action which has been completed in the past. Amen? But not just that. It's completed in the past, but it has results continuing into the present and the future. This next present and this next present and that one. So we see that. We might say this. This happened, and it's still in effect today. Listen, if that's not truth, what are we doing here? If that's not truth, if the Bible's not true, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? Because it would just be a really good man who died, and that's it. But no, he's the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who came and died for our sin. And it is tetelestai, paid in full. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Oh, I'm just getting started. Listen, the scripture says he cried out these words. Not crying, but it, it was not just tetelestai. It was tetelestai! got everyone's attention. When Jesus cried out these words, it was finished in the past, it's still finished in the present, it will remain finished in the future. Please note though, please note, Jesus did not say, I am finished. <laughs> he did not say, I am finished. That would imply that he died defeated. It was not a helpless cry of a martyr, nor satisfaction of just the termination of suffering. Oh. It's going to end, thank goodness. No. It was not the last gasp of a worn out life. Instead, his cry was the final cry of victory. There was no unfinished business left behind. It was a declaration that the wrath of holy God has been satisfied and the requirement for the payment of sins under the sacrificial system that they were under was paid in full by our divine Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Tetelestai, it is finished. Hallelujah. You can take that to the bank. It is finished. You know me. Our next point, point number two, is this. Okay, what was finished? Let's think just for a moment about that. What was finished? So it is finished, but now point number two, what was finished? Well, I'll tell you what was finished. The work that Father God had sent Jesus to do was finished. And let me just share just a few little things here. What does that include? That includes the teaching of the gospel. The teaching of the gospel was finished. Are you hearing me? Why is that important? Because there's other gospels floating around out there today. Listen, there's nothing to add to Scripture. It's complete. God breathed. Every author has it just, God has preserved it just how God wants it to be. The words of Jesus are listed there just as they should be. And I want you to see that. The first thing that was finished was the teaching of the gospel. You don't need to go to seminary. I went to seminary, but you don't need to go. You don't need to take a Bible study class. All you need to know is the good news about Jesus. We're going to talk about that in a minute. It was finished. There was no more teaching to be done. Performing miracles, that was part of what Jesus was to do. It was finished. Providing reconciliation for his people, finished. And we've already mentioned paying the debt for sin, finished. But there's more. What else was finished? Well, uh, Jesus' death was the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecies, all symbols, all the foreshadowings. Do you know what that word means? All the foreshadowings of the coming Messiah, except there was one that hadn't been fulfilled yet. That come on Easter morning. 
Are you good with me? Are you tracking with me? David mentioned this morning, uh, John uh, 11, 25, about I'm the resurrection and life. And then he said, Jesus asked, do you believe? Do you remember who he was talking to? Someone in great grief. Her name was Martha. And the scripture says, yes, I believe that you are the Messiah, the one who was to come to save the world. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what it was, okay? So all those Old Testament prophecies have been fulfilled. Think about it. From Genesis to Malachi, there are over 300 specific prophecies detailing the coming of the anointed one, and they're all fulfilled by Jesus. Do you remember? You can go all the way back. From the seed that was to crush the serpent's head, then you move forward to Isaiah 53, all the stuff about the suffering servant. Then you get to the New Testament beginning and John the baptizer, his prediction of the messenger of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, uh, he was to prepare the way for whom? For the Messiah. All of this was fulfilled and finished on the cross. Well, how does that affect us? What else was, how about for me personally, what was finished? Well, I'll tell you this. We're no longer required to pay the penalty for our sin. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? The sin debt from Adam, from his sin, was finally and forever dealt with. We don't have to go to the temple with our best lamb or our best pigeon or whatever we have and do a sacrifice. We don't have to have some priest once a year Go into the Holy of Holies, if you will, and plead on all of our, the nation's behalf. No, we go directly to God. Why? Because we're no longer required to pay the penalty for our sin. Jesus took our place. Why? How can that be? Simply this, God loves us with a love that we cannot imagine. Here's something else that affects us. Satan, you ever heard of him? Satan no longer gets to tell us who we are anymore. Let me tell you, if you, if you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're still searching and you're feeling this and, and you're hearing this, maybe not audibly, but you're feeling this, man, you're a loser or you're not good or blah, 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 on and on and on. Satan loves to tell you that. But scripture makes it clear because of what Jesus did, guilt and condemnation are finished. For the believer. Why? Because of Jesus' sacrifice. And because of that sacrifice, we can, no we can be no longer guilty through grace. Here's another one. I want you to think about this. We're in New Mexico. Think hard about this. We now don't have to try to keep a list of good works anymore. We don't have to keep a list of that. There's no book or ledger that we have to do that. Remember, tetelestai, what? Paid in full. We don't have to try to be good enough through religion. Religion is finished. Relationship now is king. Why? Because G we read it already, Romans 6, 23. Jesus provides for us the free gift of salvation. One more I want to share, and we're going to spend a little time on this. I want you to listen closely. Whether you're here for the first time in church or you've been here for decades, it does not matter to me. We need to realize this. Forgiveness can be ours. What was finished? Forgiveness can be ours. Listen, God never just required a lamb. Where did we get that idea? We have songs about it. No offense, worship leaders. But where did we get the idea that God just required a lamb? He didn't. What did he really require? A dead lamb. Are you with me? He required a dead lamb. What does that mean? He required blood. Man, I've heard people say, you, you Baptists, you Christians, why, what's your hang up with blood? Well, let me tell you, blood has always been required since the beginning of the human race. When sin entered into the world, Adam and Eve, they were hiding themselves. They felt shame for the first time. And God did what? God provided them with animal skins to cover themselves. How do you think that went for the animal? Anybody? Dead. Blood. 
So blood has always been there. Blood is all over the place at the first Passover. We mentioned what they were doing, okay? It's called expiation, if you want to know the theological term. See, they, the people, they knew that they were covered. They knew their guilt had been removed. Uh, when God saw the blood at the Passover, that first Passover, it was a sign to him that death had already occurred in the house, that blood payment had already been made. The penalty against sin had already been meted out. Expiation, that's called propitiation. That's a New Testament term that means this. It means the wrath of God is turned away. You see, God is not against them. The blood was there. So when we look up at the cross, when we look up at the cross, we see our payment has been made for sin. Aren't you glad? And when God looks down at the cross, he sees his punishment has been made for sin, has been taken care of see that we call this it's a big word but we need to know it because a lot of people don't preach and teach this anymore it should be don't go look you can look at a church website when you're going to visit look and see if they say anything about atonement because the word here is substitutionary atonement you see a substitute allows God to take the death and pass over you and me And for you and me, according to Scripture, according to Jesus, we pass from what? Death into life. Wow. It is finished. As we examine it is finished, we must be reminded that this blood we're talking about is the blood of the only person who ever walked the earth and did not sin. And so here's the famous verse. Many of you know it. It's Hebrews 9.22. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is what? No forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9.22. Well, what does this mean? It means this. I want you to hear me today, especially if you're searching today. If you're listening today, if you're hearing my voice or you're listening online and you're searching, I want you to catch this. I don't want you to miss this. What does this mean? Shedding of blood. Otherwise, there can be no forgiveness of sin. It means this. I I don't know what people have told you or what you've conjured up in your mind, maybe what Satan has whispered into your ear, but God will not randomly forgive people. You won't find it. Well, maybe he will. Maybe it's a lottery and I'll win it. No, God will not randomly forgive people. Listen, it doesn't matter how well-meaning you are. It's not enough. It doesn't matter if you live better than someone else. Not enough. We could say it this way. I hated this in school. God doesn't grade on a curve. Sorry. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. God only forgives based on the shed blood of his son as our substitute. It is finished. Know this about Jesus. Let me read to you a few verses from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, 12, and 14. This is powerful. Hebrews 10. Every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time which can never take away sins. Did you hear that? I'm happy to pray with you. I'm happy to pray for you. I'm happy to go to McDonald's with you if that's what you want to do. I can't forgive your sins. You can't forgive your sins. Even the priest, he does this. But day after day, time after time, it can never take away sins. But there's more. But this man talking about Jesus, but this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, isn't that amazing? One sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. For by one offering, the giving of his life, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified, those who have that relationship with him. One more thing I want to share 
about it from our passage, and we'll move on to the final point, is this. Did you catch verse 30, what happened after he said it is finished? Take a look. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. The scripture says Jesus gave up his spirit. Why is that important? To accomplish redemption as the Lamb of God, Jesus needed to die. There's no swoon theory. Have you heard of that? There's no conspiracy. I know we got some conspiracy theorists out there. There's no conspiracy theory that Jesus just passed out. No. He needed to die to pay the price. When Jesus bowed his head, when he gave up his spirit, it literally meant this. Are you ready? This is our Jesus. This is our spectacular powerful king of kings and lord of lords it literally means that jesus himself delivered up his own spirit death had no power over jesus until by his own choice he surrendered it dismissed his spirit jesus knew what he was doing he knew it was coming in fact jesus had predicted that he would lay down his life voluntarily and would raise it up again Let me go back to John again. Listen to these verses. These are the words of Jesus. I am laying down my life so I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Is that clear? Is that clear enough? It's really important. Again, it wasn't a defeated person. It wasn't someone who had failed. He voluntarily does this which leads us to point number three if you can spell it i want you to write the word resurrection and then write the word power resurrection power i read this statement recently i want to read it to you i thought it was pretty cool i thought the greeks would like it it's succinct concise but speaks volumes here it is what death did to jesus is nothing compared to what jesus did to death Is that good? Some of you are nodding your heads like, duh. Well, I know, but I mean, it's in one sentence. Let me read it again. What death did to Jesus is nothing compared to what Jesus did to death. So let's talk about the power. We know the rest of the story. We've sung about it this morning. Amen? On the third day. Picture this. I'm going to be dramatic here for a minute. On the third day, in that tomb, Jesus' heart began to beat again. The ruach, the breath of God, re-entered his lungs. The stone was rolled away. The Roman guards, they scattered. You see, the power behind it is finished, tetelestai, is found in the resurrection. That's where the power is found. One might say this, the resurrection sealed the deal, proved the payment, demonstrated that Jesus and Jesus alone is Lord over sin, death, and the grave. It is the resurrection that gives hope of eternal life with God. Amen? I thought you might smile at that and be excited about that to know that there's power behind it is finished. It's in the resurrection. And let me just remind you, I say it often, Jesus was not resuscitated. I hear these stories, and, I, and I, I'm sorry, I don't believe... Most, I'm not there, but I don't believe it, that someone got raised from the dead. Even if you believe that, listen, and I don't believe that, but if you did, they're still going to die. Jesus was not resuscitated. He was resurrected to live forever. And he's at the right hand of the Father. Stay with me just for a couple minutes longer. I want to close in this way. I want you to think about, can you get the picture of Jesus for a moment? Just, I, I'm visual, maybe you're not, but humor me. Try to get that picture of Jesus. No one ever suffered as Jesus did. Yet now, it is finished. No sneering enemies will spit in his face anymore. No soldiers will ever whip, will ever scourge him anymore. No priests will No religious leaders will punch him in the face or mock him anymore. It is finished. And now, according to God's word, Jesus sits 
on the throne of heaven. Amen? Isn't that exciting? Yes, amen. I want to share with you one more truth today, though, and it's this. Here's the truth. Listen. Here's the truth. I believe with all my heart. Jesus is not finished with you yet. Think about that for a minute. Jesus is not finished with you yet. The same Spirit of God that resurrected Jesus is now the same Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, saying something into your soul right now. Will you listen? Will you listen? He's saying, come to me. He's, he, he's saying, Jesus died for your sin. There is forgiveness to be had. There is purpose and meaning in life. That same resurrection spirit of God, that same power speaking to us now. Jesus is not finished with you yet. I mentioned earlier about the gospel. That was finished, the teaching of the gospel. That just means good news. Here it is. It's simple. God created the universe. Divine. Divine designer. The crown jewel of creation. <gasps> Humans. Yay, pat yourself on the back. Right? Very good. But something happened. They sinned. You remember Eve? You remember Adam? Sin entered the world. And from that point on, there was what we call a sin problem. Well, that doesn't sound like good news. No, that's bad news. But we're going to get to the good news. That's bad news. Why? Because God is holy and can have nothing to do with sin. God is holy and he always requires payment for sin. All right? Were you listening? Were you paying attention? Yes. So that's kind of bad news. But here's good news. God already had a rescue plan in place. And it was the sin his one and only son, to die on a cross for our sin, to pay the price, to pay in full, and to rise again on the third day, that's what we call Easter, to resurrect again, and to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. I want you to think about that for a minute. That's pretty good news, isn't it? That's pretty good news. And here's the best news that there is. The Bible is clear. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, what does that mean? Here's what it means. We can repent. That's the biblical word. We turn, we turn, we turn from our way, which is full of sin. Listen, I'm a sinner just like you. We, we, we have to turn from that, and we run to Jesus, and we plead with Jesus. Please forgive me of my sin. My way doesn't work. I need forgiveness. Be my Savior. Be my Lord, that means boss or controller. And here's the best news. If someone does that and sincerely means that, God is in the business of saving humans. And, be, and there are people being saved today, and that can happen here today. Listen, it's not some list you keep. It's not what church you go to. It's not what family you come from. It's simply you and God. Repent and run to Jesus and ask forgiveness. Why? Because it's clear it is finished. He did it. And just in case you're not fully convinced, let me read to you. And I don't, this is a verse we don't often look at when we talk about the good news, but it's in Romans 11, it's verse 6. Listen. Because it's God's grace that saves us, right? But listen. Now, if by grace, then it is not by works. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. That's in the Bible. God does it, not us. But we need to run to him and watch him work. And my prayer is that this will happen for you today. Let me read that one more time. Now, if by grace, then it is not by works. That's our list. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. See, Jesus did it. There's the old song. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Jesus did it, not us. What will you do with this truth? The truth of tetelestai. The truth that it is finished. What will you do with the power behind it? on the third day when Jesus resurrected. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for an opportunity 
to be here today. Lord, I, Lord, I pray this is not just an American holiday. Please, Lord, I pray that it is much more than that. I pray that we will all, everyone in this room, everyone listening online, watching online, will really examine our lives and ask the question, what have we done with Jesus? God, I pray that people will, for the first time, repent and run to you and receive salvation, the forgiveness of sin. God, we pray for that. I pray for that understanding to happen in lives, for the light bulb to go on. God, I pray for others that uh, we're keeping a list of good works, one of them being going to church on Easter. They would crumple up that list and throw it away and run to you, Jesus. I'm reminded of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That means for God so loved Lamar, for God so loved each person here, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son, Jesus. Whoever believes, whoever trusts, whoever repents, would not perish but have eternal life. God, pray for that today. And God, I pray for Christians who have done that. That it will be renewed. The truth of it is finished will be renewed in our lives again. And uh, we'll share the bad news, but we'll share the good news and then we'll share that best news. That yes, you can have this relationship with Jesus. So God, during this brief moment, this brief moment of response and reflection, remove any hindrances, disturbances from us. Help us to focus on you. Help us to focus on the cross and what took place and then on that cross. Jesus came down, was buried on the third day. The truth of the Bible of Scripture says he has risen. He is not here. God, help us to believe. Speak to us. God, let your spirit speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to ask you, if you're able, if you can, to stand with us for just a moment or two. Go ahead and focus in on the Lord. We're down here. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to answer any questions. We'll be outside afterwards. We'd love to talk to you. But would you just answer this one question this morning? What have I done with Jesus? And I'm going to get quiet and give just a minute to let God answer that, his still small voice into your life. What have you done with Jesus? Today, are you unsure of salvation, of forgiveness of sins? It doesn't have to be that way. It's called truth. We're here to help you with that. Perhaps you're back in church, first time in a while. Perhaps God is rekindling something in you. Relighten the fire inside of you. Perhaps for some of us, God's Spirit is saying, I need you to live every day for me. I need you to be a shining light everywhere you go for me, proclaiming the gospel. What is God saying to you? What have you done with Jesus? God, today we come to you in prayer, knowing that you are God, you're the creator of the universe. You hear our prayers, you know them, you know them even before we utter them. And we just want to say thank you for it is finished. Thank you for your rescue plan. Thank you for paid in full, tetelestai. Thank you 
for forgiveness of sin. God, I pray today no one would leave today without answering the question, what have I done with Jesus? God, help us. God, help us to reach our neighborhoods and our city. We thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated for just a moment. I cannot say Tedelestai because we're not quite finished. <laughs> yeah. Just want to again express thanks for each one of you that are here. And we're going to conclude our service with uh, a few announcements that we can discover on the screens. And then we will be dismissed. Hopefully you'll join us in one of our classes. Love to have you there. So take a look at the screens. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hoffmantown Church. I'm so glad you could join us for our Easter Sunday service. Especially if this is your first time, make yourself at home. There is a place for you here at Hoffmantown. Right after this service, we have adult Sunday school classes, as well as fun, Bible-centered activities for your kids and your students. So if you need some help finding your way around, be sure to stop by our Welcome Center in the Fellowship Mall, and be sure to help you out. There's also a gift for you first-time visitors as well. And if you're short on family this year, our adult family ministry is hosting an Easter lunch at 1215 upstairs in B209-221. And if you didn't register already, that's okay. Come on down. We have room for you. We'll see you upstairs in 209-221 at 1215. Well, that's all I have today. If you guys see someone you don't know, be sure to shake their hand and say hi. And I'll see you next week here at Hoffman Town Church.